So uh, the but the law is very clear about the process for submitting a proposal, and including there's a dead there was a deadline of January 31st to <coughs> submit a written proposal. So the the conversation is sort of a separate the conversation with the secretary is sort of a separate activity, but there is actually a very formal correct me if I'm wrong here, but there's a very formal process under the law for submitting a proposal. But there there was a deadline, but we made it clear to districts that the secretary would be happy to accept things after the deadline and to talk to districts that didn't submit anything because the, the secretary wanted to have as much information as possible. Okay. I think one of the confusing things, at least for me, is that we've, there are some districts that didn't submit a formal proposal, and I've started going through and actually reviewing minutes of some of their meetings, and we've, we have folks who are presenting things to us, but it's, it's interesting when you go back to some of the, the <coughs> record of, of the boards themselves, the fact that they didn't actually submit a proposal is somewhat telling, and then some of the discussions from the minutes are it's also interesting. So we just need to be really careful when we're hearing that something's a proposal. Legally, it's not a proposal if it wasn't submitted in writing by the deadline and, and was properly, went through the proper process and was actually adopted and formally submitted by the board. Mm -hmm. John, yeah, just John. in concurrence with Oliver's point, I would like the agency to give us an enumeration of districts that did not comply with the requirement to submit a proposal in writing. You can annotate it with additional information about people visiting with the secretary if you like, but I think we're interested in what the statute says, not what conversations happen. Well, I think it's important about the Section 9 process laid out in law that's coming from the, rep the elected representatives at a, a meeting that's happening, it's warned, and a meeting's come forward, a conversation is just a couple of board members coming through and there's not a, a written record of that conversation. Um, so that's where it's a little bit more problematic. Chris, I'd agree with the, the sentiment that was just expressed, by the way. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I think you know, one of the goals of Act 46 was transparency, and that's been one of the things that has been a little troubling to me is some of the, um, there, some of these things look to be a little less than transparent in how they've come together, and part of, open government is that you have worn public meetings, you follow the process outlined in statute, there's an opportunity for members of the public to come and comment just as we're doing here today, and, and we're following the process as outlined in the law, and I think that um, we should expect uh, in the spirit of fairness to all the other boards out there and members of the public who might have wanted to have had a voice in the process that we ensure that that process was respected. What's the Guess on how long it would take you to make the enumeration. Uh, um, shall I look when, I can do it now, but shall I look when um, you take your next break? Yes. I was just wondering if it could be today or this morning as opposed to next week. That's it could be today. Yeah, it's, as you go through the plan, it will say there, there was no written proposal, but then there was a conversation. So just having a number I think is helpful. Um, so any other comments, questions, clarifications needed on that last page of the memo? John. Yeah, I, I would just offer the general observation that um, Act 46 is uh, almost two different pieces of legislation. There's, there's this whole sort of carrot part which encourages voluntary mergers, provides uh, financial incentives to do so, requires uh, voter endorsement by vote. Uh, nowhere gives the secretary or the board any authority to tinker with voluntary proposals, um, but mm -hmm. simply to, uh, and, and that, the language of uh, sections six and seven is all pretty clear, and, and um, in that sense I feel that the General Assembly spoke with a clear voice. When it comes to sections nine and 10, I feel like the General Assembly kind of mumbled. Um, <laughs> You have to look very, very hard to find out exactly how this is going to work. Uh, and for example, the legislature does clearly give the secretary directions to prepare and propose a state plan, including proposals of mergers where she finds the, act, uh, the AGS proposal wanting. 
Um, and equally clearly, the, the language, if you can track it down, and you can, uh, makes it clear that the board uh, has the uh, right and, uh, to amend the secretary's proposal and adopt whatever amended plan it wishes to, including um, so-called forced mergers. And nowhere, you know, it's interesting that the language of sections 9 and 10 never seems to, the legislature never seemed to contemplate some of the situations we find ourselves in. Uh, or if it did contemplate it, it chose to remain silent on those situations, i.e. situations where the secretary or this board might propose a merger that has explicitly been rejected by the voters at an earlier time. Um, nor, nor does the, the, um, the language in these sections speak to how to resolve um, uh, different levels of debt, uh, other than to say that the board should consider, quote unquote, whatever that might mean. So it, it, I'd say the language in the, the, the sticks section, um, which is where we are, um, is, is murky and, and is, uh, if not ambivalent, at least uh, uses qualitative language that's not real clear. I don't know what consider means. Um, uh, it could mean many different things. So we're just faced with a, 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 a piece of the law where um, the, the sticks part, which did, did not go out of its way to say and did not even address the question of what happens if the voters don't like what the secretary proposes, however they might have expressed that by vote or otherwise. Uh, and so that leaves us with that, that we call conundrum, uh, to sort through. And, and that was, um, and, uh, Stacey and then Oliver, it, when this act was put into place, I was also on the board, and, and we saw the writing on the wall, and, and there are board members who are counting how many years left and going, <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to be there for that decision. And so that was um, very apparent when the law was coming out that there would be some tough decisions at the end. Um, Stacy and then Oliver? Yeah. I'm, and just microphone for... I, I'm... Oh, microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um... I'm reflecting on some of the comments that we've heard back in the beginning of 46 and now regarding the importance to not look at one size fits all and the important that was kind of in the beginning there was a lot of you know it's not one size fits all you have to look at each locale each location each school each community uniquely now I feel like a little bit what I heard today was uh, you shouldn't look at them all uniquely because that's not equitable it needs to be we're all in or all out. And I'm finding some inherent conflict in that. Mm -hmm. It's part of why I think the request to see who actually submitted a written robust section nine proposal is important because I think that will help give information to what is happening in each local community. But I would actually even like to go back to that first part, that number one, that self-evaluation. Uh, the comment that was made earlier about we're all learners still that's the most important part of learning is that self-evaluation so in addition to the written section 9 proposal I think it'd be really important to understand what communities did that robust self-evaluation to say are we meeting the goals because if we all agree the goals are where we're going if there's no self-evaluation then that's people just saying I don't want to participate so I think that's important to understand mm -hmm. This is definitely a, a tricky task, and we're going, as a board, we're going to do the best we possibly can um, to apply this law at, um, within, the, within the spirit of, of which it was intended uh, and as equitably as, as we can. Uh, but one thing we really need to be mindful of is um, we are, the state board is a, is a creation of the General Assembly school districts, municipalities are all creations of the General Assembly. And we as citizens of the state, we, have, we live in a representative democracy. We elect um, 150 members of the House, 30 members of the Senate, who ultimately, um, under the, um, the Constitution of the state, actually have the, the authority to delegate um, down to you know municipalities, school districts, etc., have the power to create, merge municipalities, school districts, etc., and the decisions that we ultimately make with the the decision with the state plan, um, I think we just need to be conscious of and accept and embrace the fact that it is not permanent. Just as many 